please make sure that you either have USB drive or pull from the Docker so that we, after like 30 minutes we'll have the image ready to like run the simulation. Um, if you have any trouble, just let me know. Um, I'm always open. Okay. Um, is a USB stick going around or? Unless you have a super good Wi-Fi, you'll probably need it. Um, but if you don't need it, it's fine. <laughs> um, okay. So first question: um, How involved are you in PX4? So first, I want to know if there are any beginners um, of PX4 here. Would you consider as big? Who considers yourself as beginner? All right. And who's who are, are there? We have some pilots here, like end users. We use it a lot. And, okay. And contributors, like who contributes a lot. And uh, okay, great. All right. So I've got a lot of uh, mix in the room. That's pretty good. Um, and how are you using PX4? First, are there hobbies on using PX4 here? All right. And academic? Good. Good. And commercial use? Okay. That's pretty clear. We're fully commercial here, all right. <laughs> That's great. And the last question, uh, this is not the uh, hand raising, but I would like to hear, do we have a mic by any chance that we can give to the audience or, yeah? Um, does anyone want to share how the experience was of getting started with develop PX4 development? If anyone wants to share the story. Yeah, Andrew, um, can we get the mic please? <laughs> Or we can just talk. Sure. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, it was a lot easier than using DJI's SDK. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's, it, it was good with the documentation. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of gotchas, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I, it, it, was, it was probably the easiest out of all of the drone platforms to get started with from a developer standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, but the documentation probably wasn't more fleshed out. So documentation was a bit uh, troubling for you? Or in some areas. In some areas. For example? Um, especially too, if you want to, let's like take for example like Wireshark and listen to Mavlink messages. Mm -hmm. Like it's setting up Wireshark, there are a couple of gotchas in there that it's like, okay, the documentation says that this is supposed to happen. But Thank you. The documentation says, oh, this is supposed to happen, but for some reason it's not working and I got to go over here and figure it out and I got to pull in these different dependencies or I got to downgrade this dependency to get it to work. Mm -hmm. um, so even though the documentation is there and I think it's it's a lot better than other places, um, there is still a couple of gotchas that, that we have to work through and getting started. All right. That's very cool to know. Never thought about that uh, specific case. Um, anyone else? Um, like, have you ever had something that's like so like frustrating? Like, you are like, oh God, like, why is it like this in PX4? Like, did you have any problem like that? Yes. So, I started about five years ago. Oops, sorry. Thank you so much, Andrew. <laughs> Started, I started probably five, a little over five years ago with the original Snapdragon and uh, the documentation for that specifically was mm -hmm. like horrendous and it was just a lot of trial and error until we figured out mm -hmm. how to do whatever we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. That being said, five years later, like the documentation I think is amazing. Like documentation is always hard for any development gotcha. stack and I think the docs are actually pretty good now, at least, um, compared to, to what we have in the past. Okay. Did you have trouble understanding like concepts in PX4? Was it something? It wasn't hard? concepts. It was just like similar thing, like the weird dependency issues or like, mm -hmm. um, it seemed like one person had got it, it, got it working, wrote some docs and then like, that was it. And then, mm -hmm. but like I said, now people are updating it and I mean, snap back gotcha. in. You know, it's all mobile AI versus the Snapdragon, but... Okay, seems like there's a lot of doc issues. I'll uh, definitely talk with Hamish. <laughs> we can improve it better. Um, okay, but I agree. Um, docs are also trouble me quite sometimes. And but, but yeah, 
I mean, yeah, they're improving, so I guess we're moving forward. Um, oh, do you have something to share? Getting started with any your own software is going to be mm -hmm. intimidating at first. Mm -hmm. um, but the explore is pretty, pretty rad, all things considered. Of mm -hmm. all the ones I've tried, it's definitely the least terrible. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, Compare it to, can you give some other examples? Or um, Also DJI mm -hmm. um, is the other main one that I tried uh -huh. and it was not fun. Interesting. Gotcha. Well, okay. Thank you so much for all the value feedback. Um, that's, uh, that's very nice to know and kind of get you know, a feeling of what you guys are looking for. So. Um, yeah, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Junu. I was a drone code intern for February till May, and now I'm working at Aterian. And I've been involved with the Follow Me project and developing some flight control uh, features. And I'm a total noob in PX4, so please, uh, let's uh, figure this out together. So, um, this is the last question, I swear. What is PX4 in your opinion? Like, what do you think defines PX4. Anyone with thought on this? If you had to explain what is PX4 to like a baby, like what would you, you know, which which feel, what, what would you even say? Um, it's a bunch of code that people that are smarter than me wrote so that I don't have to write it. So mm -hmm. that my mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Good way to put it. Hmm? Andrew? Yeah, if it was to a baby. Mm -hmm. It would probably be like a replace. It would probably be like the driver of a car, right? Mm-hmm. Except it's, yeah, the driver of a car. Gotcha. Driver of the car. Yes. All right. Cool. Um, totally agree. Um, I think PX4 Autopilot, as we know, is like a super big thing that just runs and drives a car or plane or a quadcopter. And that's exactly how I put it. Like it's just like a bunch of stuff that runs the drone. But the problem I want, I, I spotted here is that it does too many stuff and it has controls a lot, a lot of stuff. So I wanted to clarify in case you are not familiar with it, like what each uh, sector actually covers. So this is like a fancy uh, simulation thing I did of the GitHub uh, contributions in PX4 repository, and. Yeah, you can probably some of them. Some of them are like your names on the screen. It's pretty sick, and you know, I mean, this was I think like just since the last Dev Summit 2019 till now, and like, it's crazy how broad the library and the code base is, and just shows you how complex the PX4 ecosystem is. And going back to this point, what even defines a drone? Well. Yeah, Holy Bros, uh, Vince is here. I mean, this is Holy Bros X500 V2, very famous platform. Quadcopter, you probably know about it. Uh, I think it's QEA V250, 250, um, it's a racing drone. But also you can have fixed swings, uh, which is a bit uncommon. Do any of you fly fixed swings or do PX4 on fixed swings? Right, okay, three or four people. Um, and there are VTOLs. Do any of you fly VTOLs? Ah, oh, three, four people, that's great. Five people, great. So, and this one's, you know, another type of VTOL. And a rover, so it's everything, even submarine. And so that's the whole spectrum of drone, and it's so wide, and maybe you didn't know about it, but PX4 actually controls everything. And what do we mean by everything? Well, what does it take to make a drone fly? Uh, you can have like an RC plane and then like just fly it around in the park. They're doing totally fine. I think if you go to a park, they're like always flying without just a receiver. But what if you want to make it fly automatically? What if you want to make it fly intelligently? That's why we need PX4 and that's what PX4 is trying to cover and like solve. And here, I drew a little diagram showing what PX4's life is like. I mean, it does a little flight control stuff. I mean, this is the main thing of PX4, but it does so many things on auxiliary side, like sensors, radio receivers, telemetry radio, storage, camera, gimbal control, payloads, you know, 
everything and it's just gigantic piece of code and we can break that down so I'm gonna start this uh, with this uh, cute uh, little diagrams um, this is a badge that you will earn on each step if you understand each concept so we have total of five badges I'm pretty sure you're so interested in learning what these badges are <laughs> but let's start with Nodex how many of you actually know what Nodex is? Oh, I mean, actually by, I mean like, kind of, um, okay, plenty. Um, Nodex is an uh, operating system that PX4 runs on, and this was uh, so frustrating for me in the beginning because I didn't know what Nodex was. I was like, what is Nodex? Like, what is like a nutshell? Not what, what, what the heck is this? And it's just the operating system. And then, you know, when you think about a PixHawk, um, you know, a hardware, it runs on a chip, and then it needs something to run on. Like, if you imagine, like, Linux or Windows, they all have an operating system that can handle all the low-level things for you, so that you don't have to, like, carry, a, um, worry about all the file, like, resource, like, storage management, and all, all those stuff. And there are autopilots out there that doesn't utilize, an, uh, like, an operating system, but for there, you have to be really careful to not mess up these um, management of uh, you know, resources and all that. So here's Nodex. And PX4 is like a runner running on Nodex. It's pretty straightforward. And so everything in PX4 runs on Nodex. It's pretty simple. Next is modules. Um, so modules are like, as you said, if you had a driver, you probably have Oh, let's say airplane. We have a flight attendants, we have like the crew, and then we have like even passengers and everyone. We define modules as each individual um, modules that divides up the task of the whole flight control and the whole PX4 system. So like you can imagine PX4 as like a company and PX4's Nodex is like a building that it lives on. So like it's like operating system, it's like super basic. And you push off in all these like workers in that building and these workers are like modules and they can talk to each other and then like figure stuff out and make the drone fly but that's basically it they're like teammates and you know like i mean in this hotel and wherever you always have like such diverse like jobs like chefs like engineers cleaners and on modules each have their own specific task that can handle a very specific um sorry <laughs> task that they need to handle so yeah like these guys can do like flight modes, control, velocity control, state estimator, flight control, position control, ground control, station communication, but there's like plenty of more. And you can find them like in the px 4 directory. And there's currently, I believe 41 modules that's actually active. And it's really straightforward. Like logger module logs and gimbal module gimbals and literally each module is doing one task that's super specific. Now we move on to drivers. We actually have a very good driver's talk by um, Thomas being done at the next uh, hall, um, where we can actually go and implement the uh, drivers. Um, drivers are, as I mentioned in the beginning, for PX4 to actually interface with all these um, interdisciplinary uh, fields, um, it needs some something to actually talk to that uh, to each field. And I mean, they have plenty of sensors. This is just one of plenty. I'm pretty sure you guys know. But like, if you want to talk to them, like they just have no idea because like they cannot talk. It's like a different language. So the driver is like a translator between PX4 and hardware which I put like this little fancy uh, superhero because like, I mean, it literally converts data like 1025 to like a GPS data, airspeed. And this is how PX4 modules can actually interpret the data. And that's why drivers are so fundamental and necessary to understand in order to understand the PX4's uh, core concepts. So yeah, we have the driver, we have a happy module, now we have Yorp. We covered how it talks to sensors, how we have different um, crew members of the flight control software, but how do they talk to each other? 
it's a really critical piece that I believe PX4 does very well on. And Europe is a communication channel between all the tests and the modules. So this little cloud thing, you can literally use it like a messenger between all the modules. And you know, that's how you can get the data through all the different modules and like make sure that you have the latest data, make sure that you, your data like it's coming from a source that you know of, and then yeah, just control centrally what the, all the data that's going through the between the modules, and that's what Europe does. And actually, it looks something like this. So this is a graph that you can check out. Um, this is also in the link that I the repository that I shared, and this is an interactive Europe graph where you can actually select different modules and topics and topics are the, the message topics in the Europe. And you can actually check out like which modules are linked to which module with the which topic. And it's really fascinating to actually go through this and then understand like, oh, PX4, like Commander, or this module talks to this module with this specific topic. And this is super powerful feature of PX4. And so I've checked and there seems to be 82 modules and 123 Europe topics as of now. And this your topic actually doesn't cover even like multi instances and there can be like multiple derivative of the your topics but for now we have around like 123 topics that's a lot and the last uh very uh, important concept is parameters um have you ever had trouble uh doing something with parameters before do any of you had um or have you ever implemented some custom parameters um, I would like to hear a story if you have a fun story about parameters. Yes? Well, I mean, I, I have, we've implemented some parameters, some simple parameters before, but parameters, I think there's always the trouble of if you set one, it might reveal other ones. Mm -hmm. So trying to communicate that to people, I'm like, yeah, you might need to reload it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's kind of like a gotcha mm -hmm. of set map zero config from disabled and set normal or something like that or going to mm -hmm. it'll reveal all the other map config so you can just load up the, the parameter file once. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very real example. Mm -hmm. Anyone else uh, with an interesting story on parameters? I would like to hear um, if you had any experience interesting experiences. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And did that cause problem for you? Um, so now it's pretty good. So if you come to say, hey, the parameter comes in. Right. If you're hanging something, you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so in case you don't know what parameters is, um, they mentioned loading and saving parameters. It's like a Wikipedia or like a library that uh, PX4 uses to store a centralized information that every single modules and different um, code can access. And as as mentioned, um, it can you can actually load faulty parameters. It's like like if bringing a wrong book, returning a wrong book to the library, which can literally mess up your system if you don't do it right. So parameters is a super important concept as well. And for example, I'm pretty sure you guys know this, like if you go to QGC, um, the Q ground control, you can go to a parameters tab and like edit the parameters. And these parameters are directly mapped in the code base where they are defined in either YAML files or um, also in params like C definition files, where you can define like which type it is, what, how much decimal it has, like like does it require reboot and this sort of uh, metadata then gets like fetched into QGC so you can have a nice UI. And this whole synchronization is also a very um, critical concept uh, that's pretty helpful for PX4 developers. Okay, so I hope you guys understood those five concepts. Um, do you have any questions um, regarding those five concepts. So Nodex, modules, um, drivers, and URB and parameters. Did you have any um, question on that? 
All right. Um, then let's get on to development environment setup. So, um, have has any of you not uh, set up a uh, developed environment before? Like, or have any of you like had no experience at all? Um, or anyone new? Yeah. Um, okay, so you guys, are, I guess, are usually all like familiar with this, but I want to start out with the discussion on, like why we need this. Uh, the doc says we need it, but like why do we actually need it? And the first is the dumb, dumb answer is like to build because like you you need to build to put it in this black thing, and you know I mean you literally gotta build the software, and it's like a translator turning all these massive concepts into the chips language so that it can actually run. But there's also a very um, powerful aspect of the development um, environment is to simulate, and in simulation environment you can have a fake vehicle and then it can um, like simulate like airs and like wind coming in and you can simulate different vehicles, VTOLs, rovers and it's a powerful environment that you can test your vehicle on. But why do you need this simulation environment? Well, you probably like uh, have encountered something like this a lot. You, whenever you deal with like uh, some simulation or you know like building and all this development environment system and it's sometimes just feels so complex and frustrating and it feels pretty hard at times. Um, it's because we have so many dependencies. This is just an example of the Ubuntu um, script that you need to run to install all the dependencies needed for the development environment. And, you know, I mean, you can literally run this and should be fine technically, but sometimes you're running a different version of OS and there can be a lot of problems in that. So we're not going to use this today. That's why we are using the Docker. Sorry, submodules are also poop, but you probably know that. Um, yeah, plenty of hundreds of reasons why stuff don't work and we don't want that. That's just poop. We don't poop. Double poop. All right. We don't have time for that. We're using Docker. So, yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, Docker. <laughs> um, so, have any of you guys uh, used Docker before? All right. Good. Um, so, you guys pretty, pretty much, I uh, guess, know the Docker. Um, this is why I mentioned this in the beginning. So, assuming you have the Docker installed, um, you can go to the chapter where it says install docker and then there's a sector where you can read the commands and I'll show it on the slides so don't worry. Um, so first um, you install the docker which I assume you have done so but how many of you are actually following uh, going to follow this uh, development environment setup like are you actively trying to do it with the laptop right now? How many of you want to Okay, because, um, um, yeah, okay, then I'll just keep an eye on you, and then anyone else? Is anyone else trying? Or no? Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, oh, it's fine, I got it all prepared here. Um, so, assuming you're virtually installing Docker, you're gonna install Docker and then set up the PX Store Autopilot repository. So. If you are trying to build it right now, make sure that you have the PX4 Autopilot cloned. And this is all in the repository uh, link that I linked. But yeah. And once you have the PX4 Autopilot repository, um, but do you have, <laughs> sorry, but like, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how many of you are trying it right now. Um, so I, just, there was one you and then is anyone else you and then okay so two people are trying I guess um it's fine but I just wanted to know like uh, who's trying so are you done with this step um if you're done just let me know
if you have any problems, just let me know. Mm -hmm. I can I mean, also um, we have Beat who can help. Um, just um, if you have any problems. Is it working? Is it good? Oh yeah, that's why you know I put the poop there for a good reason. You know this this poop this poop thing. You know this is recursive stuff. Poop. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So hope everything is working. Um. So anyone who's wishing to try build who hasn't cloned it yet, does anyone need more time on this? Okay, um, I hope you all have it. <laughs> now, the Docker image. Um, so, the ones who are trying to do the build, uh, do you either have the image or the USB file that I've uh, like passed through the in the beginning? Not sure how many of you are actually trying. Um, I'm having a bit trouble figuring out. Um, but yeah. Um, okay. So how many of you are actually trying? Please just raise hand. Like I just need to keep track. One, two, three, four. Okay, four. Um, okay. Then four of you. Um, have you, have you, do you have the Docker image already or do, are you using, do you have the USB file already? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, and the Docker image is ready as well? Docker image is installed? Okay. No, the Docker image of the PX for um, this Ross Melodic. Have you installed the image? Yeah, do you have the USB? Okay. You don't have Docker. Well, I have installed it, so it's. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can have a little bit natively. Um. Okay, I'll just install one. But uh, yeah, I mean, you probably need a Docker if you want to try it. Um, uh, I put the. Um, have you tried the link in the repository where I linked how to install the Docker? Sorry, it's my first time like doing this workshop thing. It's uh, pretty challenging, but uh, let's get through it. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, 
So which step are you uh, stuck on, the ones you're trying right now? Did you do everything, like the image? Do you have the image and the Git repository of the PX4 Autopilot? No, you don't need it. <laughs> I really encourage everyone to try it though, because like that's the point of the workshop. Like uh, you get to try. Um, if you are not familiar with developer environments, like this is a good opportunity to kind of just give it a go and like actually simulate the vehicle and feel 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 what PX4 is like. So yeah, feel free to. Uh, How's it going? <laughs> no, it's not. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, installing Docker is hard. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Okay. Once I get to my home, I will do this. Yeah, sure. How's it going? Is a uh, Docker installed? Mm -hmm. Docker is installed. I got the and then mm -hmm. um, yeah. got to install it. Yep. From that image. Yes, that's in the next step. Okay. So if you have the image ready, then it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Do you need help? Or? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Do you have the Docker installed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. Oh, so for uh, so if you have the tar file, you just can keep it there. The next step, we're gonna extract and make a Docker image. And when you do the Docker pull, what do you Because I usually just when I build when I build PX4, I usually use the, the PX4 uh, toolchain thing. Yes, so you're using a SIG Win PX4 toolchain for Windows, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm so, so when you, Yes. Where, where do you um, sorry for all the virtual attendees. <laughs> um, it's a bit um, taking time. Um, so Docker, why do you need Docker? Is that the Docker pool? Um, just in the command line. And so I need to Docker pool. But you have the image, so you don't need to pull the image. Oh, okay. That's mm -hmm. that line is just to pull the image. Yeah, that's the. 
downloading the image with the Docker Hub option. But you have the USB, so you don't have to install it. Thank you. Do you need help with the... Yep, uh, dash i dot slash and then pointed at the Debian package dot dev. Is it working? Yeah, so far. I might just bust out my heavier laptop. Gotcha. I'm powerful. Are you installing the Docker image or? Oh no, I'm just on the bare metal. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You have the native development environment. So it seems like a lot of people are having trouble uh, installing Docker. Um, so there's a bit of delay. Should be fine. We'll we'll get on to in a few minutes. And yeah, just uh, if if the Docker install works, just let me know. Um, How's it going? This is really strange. This is what we're getting by like, installing, trying to install Docker. <laughs> never seen yeah, and he ran up, got updated. I have installed Docker a ton of times, I've never seen that. Uh huh. Hmm. I mean, we could try it out of the VM and Arch and see. Um, yeah, it's really tricky to install Docker. Um, did I, yeah. Let me try. And that was on. Try it under Arch. So that'll be sudo dash s docker desktop. That's the best one. <coughs> well, this is why I use Arch. <laughs> 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 The reason we're using Docker for all this is we're trying to manage different configurations easier than yeah. that. Um, just to, um, you know, like all the dependencies and everything. Yes. Yeah. Just it's Docker is easier. Yeah. yeah, that's why I'm trying to do it. But if you can find another way, it's totally fine. Like yeah. local yeah. development environments. Like yeah, I could walk fine. you through the 
local one if this doesn't work. Presentation is right here, right? Oh, it, it was. You didn't add the presentation like here, or you can share me the presentation like by like email or something like that. You need a presentation. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we can use the USB uh, image. It might take a long time, it's 4 gigabytes. There's a doc on the link that I, like, you can just check the repository if you have to access the repository of the, this yeah. workshop. No? Which is... Oh, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really messed this up. <laughs> I thought QR code would be good enough. <laughs> Here you can go to this, and then just there's everything here, like yeah. user group add and everything. Oh, you can go. Yeah. And you go to. to So what's the problem? Getting downloading the Docker? Installing Docker is quite tricky, I think. Um, there, they don't have Docker. Yeah. Um, he's installing Docker right now, okay. and. Okay. How much time do we have left? Um. We got until twelve thirty. We got four forty more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So who doesn't have Docker yet? I mean, he's installing Docker. Docker. And, um, who else? I think else. I mean, we have like four to five participants trying. Okay. And um, so everyone else has. Who's Docker. got Docker and the image already? Can you raise your hand? Okay, you just got two. Anyone else have any other issue? No. Okay. Why don't we do this? Give him a couple minutes more, and then we just move forward mm -hmm. and try to just answer as many questions as we can, so that we can get it recorded. And maybe you can uh, help them offline later, and then while they okay. watch the YouTube recording. Is yep. that okay? Yeah. Sure. Okay. You need USB? Uh, Jinwoo, there's a question from the audience. Yep. Uh, why are you using 
melodic instead of noetic or Ross too? Um, I didn't uh, really. You didn't pick the version of Ross. No, so, not nothing. I didn't. Specific, I just picked melodic. Um, I think it was in the doc, the main main. It was what's in the documentation. I believe I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I was just used to melodic and okay, there. Okay, so no specific reason, right? Yeah, no specific reason. Okay. You need this. Um, and then for those watching virtually, I don't have access to the history of the chat, so if you can repeat your questions, I'll be happy to do get them for you. Yeah, and, and honestly, uh, this is just so that you can skip the step of having to download the source code and all the sub modules and having to build everything. And we thought it was better to get it through Docker because it was going to save time, but apparently <laughs> we made the mistake of not taking into account the event Wi Fi. But, uh, you know, what do you say if we keep moving and just get on with the tutorial? Do you think? Yeah, um, how's the Docker situation there? Is it uh, is it working? Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Uh, thanks for trying. Um, Docker is hard. <laughs> um, okay. So the ones who have the tar file uh, from USB, you can navigate to the folder where you have the tar file, and then. I execute the command docker load and slash dash i that's the input file and then put the tar files directory do you have it there hmm? can i see oh, you oh i should like you mean show it to the yeah yeah sure anyone else needs the flash drive they're good So what are you doing here, Yunomo? So okay, I think yeah, it's t totally better to just show. Um, yeah, I totally didn't think about that. <laughs> um, so you're okay, gonna navigate here. to the drive. I have the tar file here. Okay. And then now I'm just gonna execute the command docker load input file yep, with you... this px4, oh, px4 tar file. Yep. So this is going to load the Docker image, uh, PX4 Docker image into the Docker engine so that we can run the container. Mm -hmm. Correct. So right now it's loading it into the internal Docker engine. And as soon as that is done, it's take a, it takes a, cute, a couple of minutes because it's a couple of gigabytes, but it'll go in quickly. But you already have it, right? So you can cancel it. Yeah, I just wanted to show uh, what oh, it, it would looks? be like. Yeah, I okay. think it might be helpful. Yeah, it takes quite some time. Yeah. Okay. Is it working for you, Andrew? The tar file loading? Okay. Okay. Well, let's okay. let's continue moving on. So, you know. so Andrew didn't have enough space in the laptop, so yeah. Let's assume nice. everything worked well okay. and that we got Docker running. Mm -hmm. All right. So, is that working? Okay. Yes. All right. Got it working. So, if you have it working, you will have when you type Docker images, you will have this px4io, px4dev ROS melodic image in your Docker system. Uh, Vince, have you met? Had, have it, do you have the image loaded? No. Um, you can just load it with the tar docker load command here. Okay, assuming, <laughs> assuming you have the images ready, um, but if you have trouble, just let me know like what the problem is. I can I can help them. You if you want to keep moving, I can help one on one. I've, sure. I've done this before. Yeah. Um, and 
Okay, so this part, um, you can get it from the repository. Um, I can also show the repository. Yeah, so on the GitHub pro project for px Autopilot, we have a bash script to run Docker. And it's basically that command right there. So what we're doing with that command is uh, loading the local volume of the file system where the source code is and mapping that internally to Docker. So any code change that you make on your local file system is duplicated into Docker. So inside Docker, you actually can build uh, PX4 with your changes. Otherwise, it will only be, so Docker images uh, can be um, immutable, so they, you can't save any change, but this way, your local changes and your local file system get ported over to Docker. So this is what this script is doing right now. And it might seem complicated, but it's actually just passing over uh, paths from one um, file system to the other. And another really important thing is also sending a local user ID. Uh, because the Docker image has a uh, different user, and when you run things with that user, in your files you have another user which is local to your computer, it can cause problems, that's why you have the local user ID, which is essentially passing over the user from your local computer inside Docker, so that when you run the binaries, they run okay, you have permissions to do anything with that. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so has anyone gotten the docker run command working? Who have the image? It's working? Good. Cool. Um, yeah, okay. It's good that I did practice this before. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you practice, Anwar? You. Um, you did. I know you did. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, then you should have a bash, and I can show you. Yeah, let's do it. Um, can you make the font on your terminal a bit bigger? Because I think the virtual audience is having a mm -hmm. bit of hard time reading what you're on sure. the your terminal. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so here with the Docker run command, I am running a Docker. And sorry, actually, this is wrong because uh, one key point is that, as Ramon mentioned, we are mounting the PX4 autopilot that you. Um, cloned from Git, GitHub with the Docker's uh, internal um, source slash PX4 Autopilot repository. So you must be at the repository where the PX4 Autopilot is and then execute this command. Otherwise, you will not have the PX4 Autopilot uh, source code mapped internally in the Docker image, Docker container. So that's... Uh, and when you run that, I think the biggest thing that Docker is doing for us here is taking care of all the build system so that you have to install it locally. And this is what's happening right now, is just sending local file system into Docker so that you can run PX4. Yeah, so navigate to the PX4 autopilot repository you have in your local system, and then execute the command of the Docker run with all the flags, and then you should be in the Docker, and here you can navigate to source slash PX4 autopilot, which should have the PX4 autopilot mapped directly from your volume in your local machine inside a Docker's image container. Um, is this part working for the ones we, who... We got it running. Everyone got it running? At least one? No? Raise your hands. We're good. Okay. Docker's running. Success. All right. Uh, if you have any problem, just let me know. Um, Vince, how far have you gotten? Like, uh, could you just uh, run the image, or does that part work? No. Uh, did you did you do the tar like extracting the tar into the Docker image part? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I mean, why don't you? I go there. And okay. Then you continue on moving on. Is that okay. okay? Yeah, sure. Almost full over there. Uh, All right. Um, okay, so once you have the volume mapping working and the Docker container running, now you have a full development environment set up with the, your local PX4 autopilot repository running inside a Docker container. So you're all set for building the targets. 
so then it's super simple. Um, probably know this. You can make px4 siddle, which is a software in the loop a target that you can try out and build. Um, so here you can just type px4 siddle default. And here you might uh, be a bit curious about this, but um, like default suffix in the end means that you are using the default configuration. And in PX4, there's like multiple configurations that you can try for each target, for which case, this case is PX4 SIDL. And you can have RTPS or like different uh, types of like, you can add uh, different supports depending on this uh, suffix here. But this time we're gonna try default, which is the default and it's the easiest to build. And it's taking quite some time because um, I'm running multiple um, processes at the same time. But, ooh. Actually, uh, so Pierre shows that Ninja no work to do because actually I built it before and uh, build files are already written inside a px pilots build folder. And yeah, how is this part going? Has anyone built the px 4 default yet or is it running? Just let me know the progress. Okay, while well, that's working, just for your curiosity, in case you're interested, um, I can show you where all the basic concepts in PX4s are located um, in the meantime. So the modules part, they're located under source, source under modules. So here are the like 40 or 50 different modules that I showed in the beginning. And if you want to develop your new module, you will edit this folder and all the files inside this folder. And the drivers are inside the source slash drivers. Cool. And here you have all the different, like uh, all the different um, devices that I mentioned. And this part is where all the drivers live in. And also we have the URB. Uh, URB is a bit more complicated because we have the definition files for the URB's topics separate from the actual URB's um, mechanism that runs behind, but you can find uh, all the URB topics in the message directory. So here you can see that like a lot of the like topics that you're familiar with are located and they're defined inside a message folder. And this will be very useful if you want to create a new uh, URB message and stuff like that. And the parameters are located in the YAML file and the params uh, C file that's like in specific modules and for example like we can go to source slash commander module slash slash commander and then here we'll have a lot of files but there is this file named commander underscore params.c and this will be defining the parameters that the commander uses so if you want to add a new parameter modify the parameter you will be modifying this file under the commander's directory so here you can quickly check out the commander params. Oops, true. Um, since in Docker, it doesn't have. Yeah, maybe, okay. maybe try nano. Yes, just wanted to show what it's like. No. 
Yeah, I think your image yeah. is a bit light, which is good. Yeah. My, why don't you open another tab locally? Yeah, but um, <laughs> um. can you do us a quick favor and turn on the font size a little bit? Yeah. Here. Who see. knows the shortcut to turn on the font size in Visual Studio? You you, you get you get a free T-shirt. <laughs> what what is that? Control Shift Plus. Thank yes, you. you both get a shirt. See me afterwards. Thank you. Um, okay, so here um, the parameter files that uh, we discussed, like a library analogy, they're all located. For example, in a file like this, and as described, they describe like which group, which unit, which values are permittable for each parameter, and these, of course, gets transmit, uh, transferred to QGC, where you can have the user interface. Okay, so did this part work for the ones who are trying the build? Who's got a building? Hands up, please. One, All right. nice. I got a building. Do I count too? <laughs> two? No? And I'm virtually, I got uh, two people that already got a building. Interesting. Okay. While we wait for the rest, there's a virtual question not <laughs> not related to Bill Docker. Um, they would like to know about your workspace. Um, if you're using Windows, if you're using Ubuntu, what's your code editor, and and all those settings. Workspace. Yeah, about your laptop dev, dev environment locally. What are you using as a terminal, for instance? Uh -huh. um, Your operating so, system. So this is Windows and Windows with the, the new um, Windows command prompt. This uh, Windows terminal, sorry. Yeah. And then in Windows terminal, the, currently the uh, PX4 user doc is updated and you can use it right now with Windows is you can go to the w, you can install WSL, uh, Windows uh, subsystem Linux. And then with this, you can directly have a Linux running in your local um, Windows terminal. And then here, it's as if you don't have a Docker, so it's super fast and you can build stuff. And I always use this environment to build uh, PX4 targets and everything because it's the easiest way. And it's also documented very well in the user docs. Okay, so where are we now, Juno? So we got PX4 running. Right. So you, you built PX4? Mm -hmm. So if you did this step, you should have the PX4 SIDL target ready by now. And then you'll see something like this, which didn't show up in my build in, case, in this case because I already had built it. But of course, I can try it again. Can you, before you go on, can you tell us why Oops. didn't it build if you already had it built? Why is that? Oh, because um, I was uh, I was just trying out all the commands, and then I happened to build it. Um, so, but why does the build system doesn't build it again if you already had it? Oh, that's a very good point. So, PX, uh, the big system detects if there's any changes, and if there's changes, then it will build. But if you don't have any changes, you would use the cached uh, build, so it wouldn't do anything. So here, it wouldn't do anything because I don't have any changes in the code base. Thank you, Yunu. I got a couple people here that got it running. Good. But yeah, honestly, it's super slow on my uh, device. I might just use the WSL since, yeah, my computer is a bit on the limit now. So you can do the, this is the like exact same setup, but I, I discussed the WSL, so the Windows development environment. Can you turn on the font size a little bit too? Yes. Thank you. And here, it actually builds. Why? Because I uh, remember that uh, the volume mapping was um, done to the Docker image. Hence, the Docker thinks like it's building in the Docker's internal like file system and therefore it writes, writes the build files inside a file system. But 
it doesn't have the same file um, mapping, like the directory names. Therefore, actually, if you build it in a different uh, like WSL environment, then the build seems like um, build can like throw up errors like, oh, this was built in this uh, weird uh, container in Docker. Like, how did this happen? In this case, like it shows a different uh, output because I believe it has been built in the Docker and then now it's in the local system. Therefore, the build folder contains uh, conflicting file names and stuff like that. But if you have it, um, you should have your build target in the build slash your target's name, which is SIDL default folder. And here you will have the... In the those are a lot of files. Sorry? I just mean that those are a lot of files. What is that? I, saw, I, was, I thought you were running a simulation. Oh, um, so... Okay. Can you explain to us what, what do you, can we find in there? Mm -hmm. So here, um, if you had built the target, you will have all these files generated. And these files are everything that it needs to run uh, and install uh, PX4 for, for a target for SIDL. And here, um, you will have your because it's a central concept, and you will have all the um, Mavlink definitions, because uh, as I described, it's a peripheral that the PX4 utilizes, so it needs to have a reference to what kind of Mavlink messages it uses, and those factors are therefore built into build as well. And the most fascinating part is the bin directory, because here, if you go to the bin, um, because we are running on SIDL, we can actually execute all these different um, modules. Remember the modules, like individual, like doing tests, we can run them one by one, just natively from the shell. And you can, for example, just run um, PX4, um, I don't know what you want to run, but I'm not sure if it actually would work since the PX4 instance is not running exactly. So yeah, but um, this folder includes everything that's um, like the individual binary files for modules. And yeah, these all, all the other files are including the, um, for example, ROMFS. This is a bit of a myster mysterious name. Um, ROMFS is a read-only uh, file system and therefore, this gets uh, hard copied inside a PX4 target. For example, if you flash a uh, you know, board, then it will hard copy this whole entire um, ROMFS folder into, the, into its memory. And then, as I discussed, the Nodex has its operating system, which can access all the different files. And it will have the ROMFS folder where you can access. But, OK, so if you have it done, you'll have this build folder, you have the target, and then you would have built the first target. I hope that's, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, um, now um, let's try simulation. This is our, the meat of the PX4. It has been a long time coming, uh, but the simulation is basically the next step after the target build. In simulation, you can try a lot of stuff as discussed, like flying a mission or flying a different airframes. And yeah, so, uh, wh why do we need SIDL is a question. It's like, yeah, probably no, you don't want to crash the drone and stuff. So like, as discussed, like SIDL is good for prototyping and testing out all our features. And in Docker, for example, of course, the mapping the, the display is a bit trickier because Docker, um, you know, like you cannot have like a fancy gazebo display like this, which is a simulator that is simulating a flying vehicle that PX4 uses. But if you run in a native environment, it's of course easier to display stuff like this. However, with Docker, you can still connect QGC over, which you can totally try out now. And basic concept of the simulation is that, as I described, modules run on Nodex, on actual targets. But you can just swap this out with the Penguin. 
what's the name? I, I don't know the name, but the penguin. And then you can run it on like POSIX. And then, you know, it's the exact same thing, running the binaries. And this is why it can run, because it has an operating system concept. And so how do we run Siddle? Um, similar a command. We edit, ended the last command here, where we didn't have any of these gazebo or jmap sim commands after the make target command. And this part, um, this is all de dealt inside the pxforce uh, make file system. And it's really uh, complicated, but essentially, if you have uh, one of these uh, simulators after the target's name, then it will actually execute and uh, spin up the, the simulator and then let you run the sim. And for example, um, I can run the JMF sim since it's way um, lighter for your machine. So just to note, Gazebo is really, um, really functional and it has so many plugins and super nice, but Gazebo can be really um, intensive for your CPUs because it uses way more resource. So JMF sim is a good um, alternative to try if you just want to try it. Do you know, I have a question. Yes. Why would I want to use JMAP sim versus Gazebo besides being it lighter? Is there any functional uh, feature that I would know how to use one versus the other? Um, actually, I'm not exactly sure if there's yeah. a... What, let's say, would you test the same things in one versus the other? Or would you say there's a certain features that you would rather test in Gazebo versus JMapsing? And I'm talking about like when you're developing code. Well, um, let's say for the follow me mode that you wrote. Yes, so um, so there's a mode called follow me where you can simulate a target moving and then you can make the drone follow you around. Uh, in that mode, um, using actually any mode, uh, any simulator would suffice because it doesn't go into the details like simulation environment. But where it would be useful is, for example, if you want to have a parachute deployment or some advanced um, like graphics, or if you want like some fancy graphics, of course, Gazebo will be a better choice since it just it just shows way more realistic objects, as well as have plugins like Parachute Drop, which doesn't exist in JMF CMS as far as I know. Thank you. So you can you can do a command like this. And headless means that you will run it without the display. So this uh, literally means like, you know, headless. So you don't have this big chunky computer intensive display thing running. And it makes it way faster for your simulator to run. And then if you have uh, confined resources, then you can try this headless uh, mode to make sure that you wouldn't have much problem running it because it might have some delays if your computer CPU is not fast enough. So here, um, it launched the JMF sim, uh, which should be doable in Docker. Um, and yeah, you can see that you know here it does a startup, and I've also pasted it here. Um, when PX4 startups, it has this uh, pretty sick graphic, and then it shows you like which individual like modules are like outputting some information messages and stuff like that. And for example, here, the parameters or there's also a um, PX4 main um, and also a cost like logger module, which logs the flight logs and those modules will put out messages and you can easily view them in the, in the script that you launch. And so, um, has anyone gotten to the the Siddle running part? Okay, right. Yeah, so once, did you get once we got Docker, I think we, we're moving faster. Good. All right. Uh, did you get the screen like this and all the outputs like this? Okay, that's great. Um, all right. We got. Uh, it took a long time to get here, but we are here. So let's get on to it. So you probably want to develop a module because that's the most fundamental concept that you can actually implement a new feature on. And we are going to implement a module called Mad Max. Why Mad Max? Because in Mad Max, they want to go crazy fast. And, you know, 
it's fun to have a module that's complaining when you're going too slow. And that was the idea. So we're going to pr print out different messages depending on your vehicle speed. And how do we do that? Let's figure it out. So the basics of the module architecture in PX4 is that when the PX4 starts up, uh, it will execute a script located in this folder. Well, this script um, is RCS. The naming can be really um, unintuitive intuitive because it comes from the Nodex background. Well, Nodex calls all the scripts that it calls in RC um, uh, prefix. And this script will in turn call multiple um, modules internally. And this is how actually your drone's uh, flight control algorithm and like flight logging uh, uh, modules start because decentralized script calls individual modules and executes them on top of Nodex. And so we had this logger start, tunnel alarm start, and we can have multiple uh, modules getting started. But what actually happens is that when you have the module start command, it actually executes a module name underscore main C function that's defined inside your module's direct um, source file. And this C file is uh, derived from this uh, module base, uh, base class which you need to derive from when you're writing a module. And then this basically looks like this for our Mad Max module and the Nodex OS will be calling this as it knows that not Mad Max a module will need to be called with this function. And then, as I discussed, there's a parent uh, class that's the module base. It calls the main, um, and then this main function actually deals with a lot, a lot of other different things like making sure that two modules are not running at the same time and there are like multiple uh, features that it has, but basically in the end, it calls the start command base function. This can sound very cryptic, but the module base has uh, different layers to make sure that it covers the whole module startup process. And then it calls the task spawn function. And this function is the most relevant to us because this is the function that we will be implementing. And also there's a run function which actually runs the module. And these two at the end will be what we'll be focusing on. But there's this whole hierarchy of uh, function chain that goes on when you actually execute a module. So here um, I have the Mad Max module. And this is really stripped down but fully functional module where you can actually check out that there has a task spawn. And there's three other stuff, but you don't have to care about it because this basically returns like a new module object, which is called instantiate and custom command. So you can do like, I don't know, you can put custom commands like um, make it pop. Like you can do like Mad Max make it pop. And then it may play, you know, different tunes like make it pop, like, you know, pop songs. You can do anything. And so we don't need that right now. So we don't use custom command, but we need to implement it because otherwise the module based definition requirements are not set. So it will not compile. And also there's a print usage and print usage is a um, function that shows like, hey, I'm a Max, Mad Max module, I do this, I print out this type of messages, and then you get an idea of what it's about, and it's literally like the help command that you have in a lot of different programs. And of course, the most important part for us is the run function, because this is the function that's gonna run when you actually start the function, um, the module at the end, and this is where you implement everything that you need to do. So the task spawn, as I mentioned, does a lot of different stuff, but in the end, um, it actually gets the entry point. Uh, the run trampoline sounds super cryptic as well, but this uh, function is basically defined like this, and it uses the instantiate function, so it gets the object pointer, and then it actually calls the run function so it's literally just making sure that you have enough memory and then you're allocated and then you can actually run it. So there's uh, multiple layers, but you don't have too much care about it. And there's also exit and cleanup where it actually cleans up all the potential issues. And so, yeah, that's basically how it works. It fetches this run trampoline function and then you can call pix for task spawn command, which will spawn your task. 
uh, on top of Nodex, and then this is how your module will be running. This is the most base layer that you will get to. And so this is it. This is the run function that I implemented. Um, so what do we do here? So I explained that UORB is the main communication channel between all the modules. And we are implementing a module, and we want to read the vehicle speed. So how do we get the speed? There is a UORB topic called vehicle local position. And this vehicle local position topic is actually only um, published from, as far as I know, the multi-copters um, position controller. And then it will output current vehicle speed, position, and acceleration, and all the different informations. So we can check if this vehicle position, a local position, uh, your topic has been updated with this call here. And then if we have an update, then we know that we, then we want to read the speed from it. And PXOR has a lot of different, uh, um, you know, um, how do you call this? Vector 2F um, file type? No. Structs? It's not a struct, you know, like, uh, I don't know the name for this, but, you know, you have all these um, memory types. Yeah. Data types. Data types. Thank you. <laughs> so, VXR has multiple data types, and Vector2F is a float vector2, so, like, it has a two uh, components, and then you can do a lot of fancy calculations, like calculating the norm and everything, and this is used a lot in the navigation and uh, flight control um, code. And then basically, I'm getting the, fetching the information from the your topic, like Vx and Vy, uh, which is the pla planner um, velocity in the north and east direction, because PX4 uses a north, east, and down convention. And then we'll basically calculate the norm of it through this data type of vector 2f as it supports it. And then this basically gives exact magnitude in meters per second of how, what speed we're actually moving at right now. And then we enter this switch case, um, oh sorry, if, else if um, case, where we compare it to different velocities that we desire. And then, you know, if we're going to slow, it complains. And then if it's getting to like five meters per second, okay, we're getting there. And then if it's like less than 10, like more than five, it's like, let's go. And then, I mean, you can, Mad Max also has its limits. So when it goes after 10 meters per second, it says, oh, it's too fast. And then you can notice that there's a while loop um, because run function is not uh, looped. It's, it's, it won't be called uh, in a loop. So you have to implement your own loop with this condition of should exit, which is also defined in the module base function. And then at the end of the while loop, you can do a sleep. Um, here I put the uh, one second of uh, time because I don't want to run it at too much. Um, if I if I run it at a super fast rate, then it will print out message like at 500 or one kilohertz. And so by having this px 4 u sleep, it puts this thread on on sleep state so that it utilizes the you know, operating system's ability to have threads, and then it won't execute anything, and then it will return after one second, and then it will run again, and then this um, loop will continue. Hence, we have a reoccurring code that's running in our module. And that's not all. When you build a module, you actually have to take care of the board config. Um, if you remember, like px 4 siddle default, this postfix thing, this is exactly what the board config is about. And if you type like make target name board config, which I can do right here, for example, if I go like make px4 siddle um, board config, then I will enter a screen like this, where actually you have all the different modules or you know different features that you can put into the target that you're building right now. So since I have the Mad Max module, you can actually find it here. You can go down here, and then you can select it or not select it to include it or exclude it from your build. And for our case, of course, we want to include it. So we'll save configuration. And basically, it added to the board configuration file. And now we are all set for building this module into the target that we want to build, which is PX or Siddle. And if you want to build uh, for the actual target, like the hardware, of course, you need to do this again, where you actually have to type the name again 
And for Pix Pixoc uh, 4, it's PX4 FMUV5. So this will have a different, as you can notice, there's no testing, there's no Ethernet checked in, so you have to make sure that you have the modules checked in, which I already did, and then you can build it and it will include this module. Otherwise, your module will not be included and this is a necessary step to get your module running. You know, I got a question from virtual audience. Mm -hmm. Is the board config the same? Is modifying the board config the same as modifying the CMake list on the root of the board um, directory? CMake list in the root of the PX4 autopilot directory? No, of each board directory. Each board directory. Okay, so I think it's easiest to show. Yeah, go, go to so the mark. Here, it's the default.px4 board. So as I said, you can have all the post fixes like site file debug. RTPS and default one, for example, has this configurations. And the CMake list, I believe, is um, not sure exactly, but this part is separate, if I'm not mistaken. So it deals with like a board specific, um, you know, low level uh, concepts. So I believe you don't have to deal with the CMake list for including or excluding modules. What you need to deal with is the PX4 board file where it actually includes the configuration for the modules. And here you can actually find it. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's weird. Um, yeah. Maybe it's, uh, oh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a different, um, yeah, I have a uh, multiple workspaces, but for example, if I go to the correct workspace, then it will show the um, um, so this file, which is a PX4 Siddles um, board config, will include the MadMax because oh, that's that's weird. Um, Sure, I included it. Okay, but <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, that's um, a good question. Potentially, yes. So what's happening here is we cannot find the source code. Because Juno has so many copies of PX4 in his laptop. This is really busy. Yeah, you can try grabbing maybe. Yeah, um, it, it's just, fine. We don't we don't need to see that file directly, but just make sure again that it has it. Okay, it has it. Yeah, it's there. That's pretty weird. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. So. Oh, I think I know what it is, maybe because maybe there's no default uh, postfix, so it might have thought that it's a different target, so it added a different PX4 board by any chance. So we go here. Oh, it's on. Sorry, I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> um, here. Yeah, it's a bit... Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's... So, okay, if we run the Siddle now, um, we can make the you know, JMF sim as we had it. So... So the JMF sim, um, it will execute this module, it will actually run the module's run function and it will be outputting this uh, message as I wrote it in the code. You know, as you can tell here, you know, at one hertz because it's running in a thread sleep of one seconds and because we're not moving right now, it's gonna say we're too slow because we're not moving at all. Okay. Um, so I wanted to showcase how actually the hardware part works. So 
hardware is different from simulation because you will have a different board config file, of course, but also you might have different interfaces to it. In simulation, you had a very easy access to the PX4's Nodex shell. In this case, it's actually not Nodex, it's a POSIX shell because we're running a POSIX operating system, but still we have an easy access. But on hardware, it's a bit di different. So if I plug in the hardware, you can interface it with the QGC, which is the default PX4's ground control, control system. And then it will take some time and then connect to the vehicle. So here what's happening is that I have built the FMUV5 target as the command I described. And then, so I excluded this step since actually it's pretty tricky to upload it if you don't have a native uh, build environment. So first uh, way that you can do if you have a native environment is you just post fix upload and then it will upload that firmware onto your autopilot automatically. But since we're using Docker and um, also the WSL or other development environments, it's not as easy as this. So a lot of cases what I end up doing is just making a target and then you have the target um, file built in the build folder and then you copy it over and then uh, to your directory that you want to store this file. And then you open up QGC, go to the firmware tab and check out the custom firmware and then upload it. It's a bit tedious, but uh, it just uh, comes as a bit of a limitation of having non-native um, envi build environment. So at this point, I am actually running a simulation inside the hardware. That means that, as I described, there's a JMAP sim gazebo, but actually you can run the simulation inside the hardware so you don't even need any simulator running. And in this case, it thinks it's a quadcopter and then you can take off. And this is all running inside this hardware. So you can take off and then it takes off. It thinks it's taking off and it has its own imaginary location. And then, okay, it, start, it started the mission. I didn't expect that, but since I already flashed it with the uh, Mad Max module enabled, you can go to Analyze Tools, go to Mavlin Console, and then open it up. Okay, it may have not started the module, but we can start it again. So here, um, it's a quick demo where you can have the plan that's um, you know, have a different speed of uh, the vehicle. Oh, that's a bit weird. Um, yes, it's printing out the same message, which, okay, yeah, it's, it's a bit weird. I think maybe it's uh, related to the simulation um, environment. But um, based on the speed, it basically enters a different if as else uh, condition we described in the run function. And then it will be printing out such uh, messages. And this is a very um, simple case where you can just test out the idea of implementing a simple module and then actually running it in simulation and checking the output. And of course, it's different. You have to have a different Mavlin shell and QGC to do it, but that's the difference between simulation only and actually using the hardware. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can, you have access through the Mavlin shell and through this Mavlin shell, um, can I stop the module? didn't work. <laughs> um, you can actually listen for the vehicle local position message in itself because you, you have this uh, complete um, access to Nodex shell. Um, so here you can say listener vehicle local position. And then it will actually print out uh, exactly what the, what the message uh, was describing. So, for example, here, this is the exact uh, 
values that the MadMax module would have received because it's through the Europe and listener is the module that listens for the Europe topic. And then, yeah, you can play around with the Europe, it's not shell or inside a module. Yes. Okay, let me repeat the question quickly for those virtually. Is there a way to inspect SBUS or RC the way you're doing with Velocity? You mean inspecting, like inspecting if it's connected or? Yeah, like the, the, so like the status of, of like what each channel is receiving. Yes, you can do that, yes. Um, so for example, um, so I'll show you a really contextual uh, way to find it. So you want to find the RC values, right? Yeah. And you kind of have to know roughly what you're searching for, but I know that there's a RC update uh, module that actually deals with this RC input um, values. And here, um, you can you can check out its head header since it needs to include all the your topics that it communicates on in the header. So these are all the topics that the RC update uh, would communicate on. And now we're down to basically these um, these ones because they look like the most relevant ones. And you know you can check out the individual Europe topics by going into the message folder. So for example, if I want to check out the uh, input RC Europe message definition, I can just go to message folder slash input RC dot message. And here you will find exactly what this topic is describing. And here you'll have all the RC values. So pretty sure this is the PWM value. So we can check out this uh, listener by listener module. And we access it, of course, with the Mavlink shell. And here we can do listener and input RC. But it's never published because I don't have any RC connected right now. But that's how you would go through the process of finding out which your topic to search for and uh, finding out if it's actually the topic we're searching for and then actually fetching the data in the mapping show. That's the process. You know, so is the listener module, can it give me then any UR packet that I want to read? Yes. Okay. So you can actually check out all the UR topics getting published by your top. And I think you're stopped right now. Sorry? I think simulation stop. Oh, let me check the status. Okay, maybe it was not a. Yeah, <laughs> the simulation may have stopped, but still the your topic, uh, your uh, module is running, so you can call your and status, and then it actually shows all the different um, topics that are getting um, published, and you can read every single one of them uh, with the listener command and. The input RC, of course, was not available because it doesn't. It was never published, hence it didn't even get registered in the Europe's um, internal like messaging system. But of course, you can check like all the different stuff, like actuator arm, actuator controls, and CPU load stuff like this. And if it's very helpful to figure out this in the field if you have access to the mapping shell. Okay. Um, to learn more about PX4, um, you can check out the docs. It has a lot of stuff. It can be messy, but it holds almost everything that you need to know. I just need to read it and then, like, um, since there's so much information, just not get discouraged and just keep on reading. But you don't have to do it alone. You can post it on the Slack channel and ask for people's help. And then always there are developers who are willing to help. And you can just yeah, you can just ping me as well, and then do whatever I can to help you out getting um, your questions solved. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for the. Thank you, Yunwoo. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Yunwoo, and I want to thank everyone for your patience. This is the thank first you. time that we do a workshop on getting started with PX4. Thank you for sticking with us. We know it was a slow, rough start with Docker, but um, we just wanted you to have a way to be able to run PX4 that was 
consistent and you can take it home and be reliable so that you can test these things. So everything that Junwoo said is going to be recorded. It's on YouTube. So thank you for your help. And let us know on Slack how we did. All right. Thank you. Thank you.